I'm Laura, and I'm 31 years old. I used to live with my parents and my older sister, Mary, but she moved out three years ago after she got married. I work from home running an online business. I first got interested in making apps when I was in middle school after my grandfather gave me a computer for my birthday. It turned out to be a big success for me. But sadly, my grandfather passed away four years ago. He lived with us, and he was the only person I felt truly close to. After he died, I became more withdrawn. My parents work during the day, and I spend most of my time alone, quietly working. They don't really understand what I do. They just think I'm playing games all day. My sister, Mary, also looks down on me. Growing up, my parents always favored her, and I was often ignored. My interest in computers grew because I felt left out by my family. My grandparents were the only ones who truly cared for me and spent time with me. When I turned 15, they gave me a computer, which led to my current career. My parents have never given me a birthday gift, so this meant a lot to me. Now that both of my grandparents are gone, my room feels like the only place I belong in this house. Even though my parents have their flaws, I don't hate them. They raised me, so I try to help around the house as much as I can. One Thursday morning, my mom suddenly opened my door and asked, Laura, is breakfast ready? It was past 8 a.m. Yes, it's on the table, I replied. Since my grandfather passed away, I've been doing most of the chores around the house. My parents just assume it's natural for me to take care of everything since they think I'm always playing games. I prepare all the meals, clean, do the laundry, and handle the shopping. Oh, did you see your dad? He had breakfast early and left, Mom added. Dad's gone out again, huh? I replied. Lately, Dad has been leaving early on weekends. My parents don't really fight, but Dad usually can't say no to Mom, so he probably leaves early to escape the busy schedule she plans for him. We haven't really talked since I was in middle school, so this is just what I think. Mary and her family will visit around noon today, Mom mentioned. Mary's coming? I asked, a bit surprised. Don't be so shocked. She's your sister, after all. It's been a while since you've seen each other, hasn't it? Yeah, it's definitely been a while. I think this is the first time she's been home since she got married, I said. Even though Mary got married three years ago, and she's gone out to eat with mom and dad, she hasn't visited our house until now. When Mary was pregnant, she didn't come home. Our parents went to visit her instead. I figured something important must be going on for her to come now. She wouldn't come without a reason, right? I thought to myself, yeah, she mentioned she has something to talk about. Since she's coming after so long, make sure to prepare a nice lunch, my mom said. Got it, I replied, even though I felt a bit uneasy. I was excited to meet my nephew, but Mary had always been cold toward me in the past. I realized I hadn't gotten this month's grocery money yet, so I asked, Mom, can I get this month's food money? I'm about to go shopping. Didn't you get it from your father? She replied. He told me to ask you, I said. She frowned. I don't have much on me. Last month, I only gave you $100. Here's $50. She slapped the money on the table. But I need the full amount this month, I said. If you worked properly, you wouldn't have these issues. How long are you going to keep wasting time, she snapped. I told you, I am working, I tried to explain. I don't want to hear excuses. You're just playing games for pocket money. Don't talk about working when you can't even live on your own, she said harshly. That's not true, I insisted. Enough. I've given you some money. Get the rest from your father, she said, storming out and slamming the door behind her. After a deep sigh, I went back to my work. Once I found a good stopping point, I went out to do the shopping. I felt uneasy the whole time, so I rushed to finish by early afternoon since Mary was supposed to arrive around then. When I got back home, I started cooking right away while my mom relaxed, watching TV. My dad returned just before noon, and soon after, the doorbell rang. Glad you could come, Mary. Come on in. Mom's cheerful voice filled the house. I'm back. It feels nostalgic being here after so long, Mary said as she stepped inside. Welcome back, Mary. It's been a while, I said. Oh, Laura, you're still here, she replied, glancing at me. It was my first time seeing Mary in a long while, and she was dressed head to toe in designer brands with heavier makeup than before. 
She wore a confident smile as she looked at me, just as she always did. I'm so tired, Mary said, collapsing onto the sofa. I looked around, hoping to see my nephew, and finally spotted my mom holding him. He looked around with wide, curious eyes, which made him even cuter. What are you staring at? Hurry up and get lunch ready, Mom said coldly when she noticed me watching my nephew. Mom, are you still making Laura do all the housework? Mary asked in a mocking tone. Of course. She's just in her room playing games all day, so she might as well be useful, Mom replied. That's true. She costs money just by being here, Mary added with a smile, and they both continued their cheerful conversation. I tried to have a normal conversation with Mary, asking her about her married life. How's married life, Mary? It must be tough with taking care of a child and doing housework, I said, choosing my words carefully. She replied, I don't do any housework. I hate the thought of having to do chores every day like you do. What do you mean? I asked, surprised. We have a housekeeper, so I don't have to do anything, she said with a smug smile. I remembered that Mary's husband is a doctor. When they got engaged, Mom and Mary were thrilled. She was marrying someone wealthy. Wow, having a housekeeper must be nice. Is your husband busy with work? I asked. Yes, he is. He's hardly home, even on his days off, because he often gets emergency calls. Despite our differences, it felt nice to have a somewhat friendly conversation. But then Mary's tone changed. You have such an easy life. Do you even know how hard our parents work? She said, stopping me as I was about to finish preparing the meal. What? What are you talking about? I replied, confused. You're still pretending to work, aren't you? At your age, you should understand that because you're not independent, mom has to work harder, she said sharply. I've told you and mom many times, I work from home and make enough to support myself. You don't have to worry, I explained. If that's true, then move out and live on your own. You say you're earning money, but it's probably just pocket change, right? You've never had to struggle like mom, she said, not believing a word I said. To her, I was just freeloading off our parents, unable to be independent. I stay in this house because it belonged to grandpa and grandma. This place has so many precious memories for me, I replied. I can't believe you're still hanging around here for that reason. If it were me, I wouldn't want to stay in such an old house, she said. The house is old, but we renovated it for grandpa, with changes to make it easier for him to get around. The kitchen and bathroom were remodeled, and we have newer appliances, so I don't feel like it's inconvenient. Our grandparents loved Mary, too, but maybe she felt annoyed by their ways, so she has no attachment to this place. For someone like me, marrying into wealth was the best choice, but that's impossible for you, Mary added, and Mom laughed along with her. You can't get married, you can't show us any grandkids, and you won't even live on your own. You're really useless. Mom said. I don't think marriage is everything. I make my own money, and I'm okay with that, I said, trying to stay calm. Stop saying that and quit lying already. Dad, Mom, and I are all tired of your lies, Mary said coldly. Just then, my nephew started crying, and Mom shot me an angry look. I avoided her gaze and went back to the kitchen, frustrated, to finish preparing lunch in silence. I realized that trying to explain anything more to Mary or Mom would be pointless. Even though Mary criticized me, she still ate everything I'd cooked. I'd heard she had something important to talk about, but by the time she left that evening, she hadn't mentioned anything. However, I noticed something strange about her behavior. She kept checking different areas around the house like the upstairs rooms, bathroom, and kitchen. Since she moved out, we had been gradually remodeling these spaces, and her detailed inspection seemed odd. But she left without saying anything, and I wondered when we'd see each other next. The next morning, while I was making breakfast, Mom spoke up. Make sure the house is clean by next Thursday and prepare a nice dinner. Mary, James, and the kids are coming. They just visited yesterday. Why are they coming again? And why is her husband coming too? I asked, surprised. It's nothing to be so shocked about. Mary said they have something important to discuss, and there's something for you, too, so keep your schedule open. I'm just happy I'll get to see the kids again, Mom replied. I felt uneasy. 
Mary Hun visited once since she got married, and now, suddenly, she was coming again so soon, and this time with her husband. I couldn't figure out what her real intentions were, but it didn't feel right. What I didn't know was that Mary and Mom were already having discussions about me. Can you believe the house is in Laura's name? What was Dad thinking? Mary asked. Don't worry. If we make Laura feel like she's a burden to everyone, she'll leave. The right to live here should be ours, Mom replied. I got so busy with work that Thursday came before I knew it. The last time I saw Mary's husband, James, was when he came to introduce himself before their wedding. He had decided to become a doctor because of his father. Though he was handsome, there was something cold about him. Mom was thrilled when she found out he was a doctor's son, and she welcomed him warmly. But since then, James hadn't visited, and none of us had seen him until now. When Mary, James, and my nephew arrived, I had already set dinner on the table. James looked like he had lost some weight since I'd last seen him three years ago. As I returned to the kitchen, Mary followed me. Did you pick up these side dishes from a supermarket? She asked. I wonder if this food will be good enough for us since we're used to high-quality meals, Mary commented, looking down on the dishes. This is a dish Grandma taught me how to make, so I know it's good, I replied calmly. Mary looked annoyed for a moment but quickly covered it up, putting on a smile as she started serving the food. During dinner, she mostly bragged about her child, going on about how he was better than other kids. James barely said a word, staying distant and only half listening to her stories. As she continued, Mary gave me a nasty look and said, Seeing our adorable child, don't you wish you had another grandchild, Mom? Yes, we could have had more grandchildren by now, but that's impossible since Laura's not even married, Mom said, glancing at me. Before thinking about kids, you need to find someone to marry first. But how could you meet anyone when you're always in your room playing games? And you're still living here without a job. Mary added, piling on the insults. I finished my meal quietly and was about to leave the table when Mom stopped me, her voice filled with anger. Are you just going to walk away? We're not done. There's something important we need to talk about, so sit down and listen. Let's get to the point, Laura. Can you please leave this house? Mary said suddenly, leaving me in shock. You should try living on your own for once. Both mom and dad are tired of living with you. If you stay here, you'll never change, she continued, sounding like she was doing me a favor by advising me to move out. You need to realize how much of a disappointment you are, Mary added. It would be good for you to learn to earn enough to live on your own and understand how hard life can be. Wait, mom. How many times do I have to say I'm working and making my own money? When will you believe me? I replied, my hands shaking with anger. Just because you make a little money from your hobbies doesn't mean you're earning a real living, mom scoffed. No, I earn enough to pay for my own expenses. I even paid for all the house renovations after grandpa passed away, I said firmly. I had used my savings to fund the renovations, and my parents knew I had covered every payment. Mary smirked. Oh, you think you're something, don't you? That money was grandpa's, wasn't it? Don't act like I didn't know. He gave you money before he passed away, right? Grandpa had given me a bank book shortly before he died, a result of him and grandma saving up, worried about my future since they saw how neglected I was. They must have hoped it would help me someday. How do you even know about that? I asked, stunned. As soon as grandpa gave me the bank book, I had stored it away in a drawer and told no one about it. It was easy to find. I saw it in your drawer, Mary sneered. But where's the cash card? I couldn't take out any money. How could you do something like that? That's terrible, I said, shocked by her actions. They were always kinder to you, she continued. But to think they left money just for you, ignoring the rest of us, that's so unfair. Don't disrespect grandpa and grandma like that. I replied angrily. They saved that money because they cared about me. At that moment, I realized why my parents had never brought up the renovation payments. They must have known about the bank book all along and expected me to use it to cover the costs. They assumed I'd use the money from that account to pay for everything. Let's leave the money aside for now. At least the house has good amenities and new appliances, thanks to it, Mary said dismissively. I hate that you got it all, but I'll let it go. 
Grandpa and Grandma probably knew you'd never become independent, she added with a mocking look. Was her recent inspection of the house meant to check on these upgrades? As your sister, I'm really worried about you, you know, she said, feigning concern. I just glared at her. Ignoring my look, she finally got to her main point. Actually, James is about to start a new hospital, she said proudly, looking at him, though he kept a serious face. What? I asked, caught off guard. We're planning to move here, too, she continued. James wants to build a hospital nearby. There's plenty of open land and not many hospitals around, so we'd use this house as our base. That's why we need you to move out, Mary stated matter-of-factly. But you can't just demand that out of nowhere. I protested. I know the house is in your name, but you should hand it over for mom and dad's sake. Just let me have it, she insisted. Why do you get to decide that? Of course, mom and dad agree with me, she said confidently. They want you out too. I remembered that grandpa had transferred the house into my name before he passed away. At first, I didn't understand why grandpa had put the house in my name, but now it made sense. Mary said, Dad's the real head of this house. Your name on the papers doesn't matter, so just leave quietly. No. This house is full of memories of grandma and grandpa, I replied. Stop being so childish, she snapped. You're just a parasite here, making things harder for everyone. It's time for you to go, Mary shouted like she was delivering the final blow. Laura, don't you think you're a bad influence on your nephew, my mother added, turning to me. Do you really want him to grow up seeing you depend on us for everything? During all this, my father kept looking down, distracted by his phone, and James just sat silently listening. At that moment, I realized they wouldn't listen to anything I said. I needed to get out of this toxic place. Fine. Do whatever you want, I said, heading to my room. I was furious, but I forced myself to think calmly about my next steps. That night, I made a decision. The next morning, after Mary's family left, I went downstairs to find the house still messy from the night before. My parents were still asleep. I grabbed my laptop and went to a nearby cafe to plan. Soon, my phone started buzzing with calls and messages from my mother, demanding I come back to make breakfast. I ignored them and focused on my plan. I looked up moving companies and was able to schedule one for the same day. I timed my return to the house when I knew my parents would be at work. The house was a mess after just a few hours without me, and I couldn't help but feel a mix of frustration and relief. Shortly after, the movers arrived with a truck. Which items are we taking? One of the movers asked. Everything I bought, I replied. The movers quickly packed up all my belongings, appliances like the washing machine, fridge, and microwave, along with smaller items like dishes. After they were done, the house felt empty and strangely sad. Legally, this house was still mine, but I no longer wanted to be here. As I left, I felt a sense of freedom and knew I wasn't wasting my grandparents' love and care. That evening, my mother called, furious. What's going on? All the appliances are gone. Did you take them? Of course I did, I answered. You wanted me out, so I'm leaving. And I'm taking what I bought with me. I'm glad you're leaving, but it's not right to take the appliances, my mother said. Why not? They're mine. I bought them. You bought them with grandpa's money? No. How many times do I have to say it? The money from grandpa is very important to me. I wouldn't touch it. I bought everything with my own money. I sent her a picture of my bank book showing today's date to prove it. I had just withdrawn $170, so the balance should have been clear. You're horrible to do this to your own parents. Fine. We don't need your appliances. We'll ask Mary and her family for help. I don't care, but you all need to leave quickly. That house is in my name. Don't be ridiculous. That was the last I heard from my mother. Inside, I hoped James could buy the house, not just the appliances. A few days later, Mary contacted me sooner than I expected. Laura, I hope you've calmed down now. Can we talk just one more time, please? Her tone sounded different, as if she was being careful. What do you want? I'm busy with work. Make it quick. I've been thinking. It was a mistake to try to kick you out. We're family. Shouldn't we live together? After calling me a parasite, now you want to talk about families? 
Absolutely not. You guys have moved in already, haven't you? Yes, we moved in yesterday, but there have been some problems. Oh, about James. He got fired from the hospital, right? I know. It's amazing you kept quiet about it. How do you know that? I'm not as clueless as you think. A friend of mine works in admin at the hospital James was at. She told me he was fired for having an affair. It turns out that James had an affair with a nurse and got her pregnant. He tried to convince her not to have the baby to keep the affair a secret, but the angry woman exposed everything at the hospital. Fearing for the hospital's reputation, James's father decided to fire him. James couldn't tell Mary the truth, so he made up a story about building a new hospital to have a place to live. I just found out about it recently and was shocked. Now he has no money and is being sued for compensation by the woman's husband. Plus, dad has left home. What happened to dad? According to Mary, it seems my father also had an affair. He left a note and divorce papers before moving out, right before Mary and her family were supposed to move in. Apparently, he wrote complaints about my mother in the note, and after reading it, my mother became bedridden. You can't just leave us in this situation. Right, Laura? You'll help us, won't you? You still have the money Grandpa gave you, right? What are you saying now? I asked, and my mother showed me the photo of the bank book. After all this time of not believing I could support myself, it's funny how they finally believe I'm working, just when it suits them. You can't rely on me only when it's convenient. I'm not coming back. I put up with everything because that house held grandma and grandpa's memories, but now I realize those memories will always be with me. Wait, please, Mary begged. I don't have any good memories with you, mom or dad, so asking for my help now doesn't feel right. And remember, the house is in my name, so you'll need to move out soon. Saying all this out loud made my heart feel lighter, and I knew I could now find real happiness. Please, Laura, you're really going to abandon your family like this? I didn't respond to any more calls or messages from my mom or Mary. For the first four months, they kept trying, but they eventually gave up, and now my days are peaceful. I heard that Mary and James open a hospital with borrowed money, but no patients come. Probably because James's affair partner has been spreading bad rumors. My mom developed depression from the shock of my dad leaving and is now in the hospital. When I moved out, I decided to sell the house, and I went through with it. Seeing the for sale notice, Mary and her family had no choice but to move into a nearby apartment. With debts and no patients, they're struggling, but that's no longer my concern. I do hope my nephew finds happiness. He's innocent in all this. As for me, my work is going well, and I'm even expanding my business. I'm grateful to my grandparents, and I hope to someday find a place where I truly belong. I'm determined to keep living my life to the fullest. As of today, this house belongs to us. Everyone else, please leave, said the unexpected relatives who showed up. It was just a few days after Jack had passed away. Ten of them appeared out of nowhere at our house, claiming it was theirs. I couldn't help but laugh. They didn't know anything. They stared at me, suspicious, and demanded an explanation. Don't you know? This house is already mine, I told them, revealing the wish Jack had left for me. Hearing this, they were shocked, their faces turning pale. I'm Lauren Alexis, 55 years old, and I work in the kitchen of a restaurant. Lauren, can you work overtime today? My manager asked. No, I've already told you that I can't, I replied. That's right, your husband is still in the hospital. We should have asked someone else to cover for you. I'm sorry, Lauren. You can go home on time without any problems. I work at a popular Italian restaurant in town. People love it because the food is affordable and tasty, so we're always busy. I used to be fine with working extra hours, but since my husband Jack has been suffering from severe cancer and staying in the hospital, I've been leaving work on time. Jack is three years older than me, and we've been married for 32 years. This is the first time he's had such a serious illness. The cancer was found during a health check, but it had already spread to other parts of his body, and his strength quickly started to fade after we got the news. It's unfortunate. Staying at home and working remotely made his health decline even more. He used to work as a freelance interior designer, doing everything from his computer. Thanks to him, I didn't have to worry about house chores, and I could focus on my work. 
but after he got sick, I had to adjust my work schedule. I now start early in the morning and leave before the restaurant gets busy. I want to spend as much time as possible taking care of him. I often apologize to my coworkers for causing them trouble. What are you talking about? Don't be so down, they'd say. It'll worry your husband. Just stay positive and take good care of him. Don't worry, the manager will handle everything if needed. We're here to help, my colleagues would joke, trying to cheer me up. When I asked, everyone agreed without any complaints. In fact, they even suggested I leave early. The manager was worried about my financial situation, so he adjusted the shifts to make my current work schedule possible. I feel lucky to work in such a great place, and when things calm down, I plan to repay their kindness. With that in mind, I thank my coworkers and sign the attendance sheet. I quickly gather my things and hurried to the hospital. Ah, you must be Mrs. Alexis. The doctor just arrived and is speaking with your husband. A nurse said warmly when I got to the hospital. Hearing that, I rushed to Jack's room. As I entered, I saw Jack talking with the doctor. Your wife is here, the doctor said. You're done with work? Thanks for everything, Jack said with a weak smile. Jack is older than me. He used to have a youthful face and people often thought I was older. But ever since the cancer diagnosis, he seems to have aged so much. His once bright face is now thin and pale, and his smile is faint. When he first got sick, he told me, I won't let this illness beat me. But his body is getting weaker day by day, no matter how much he tries to stay strong. I was just explaining your husband's condition, the doctor began, but Jack interrupted. Let me tell her, doctor. An uneasy feeling crept over me, and I could tell the doctor felt it too. With a quiet nod, the doctor left the room. Hey, Lauren, how long have we been married? Jack asked, staring out the window. Worried about him, I answered carefully. Thirty-second years. Thirty-second years, huh? It felt long, but looking back, it passed so quickly. Stop, I said, fearing where the conversation was going. It sounds like you're saying it's almost over. Maybe another seven months, Jack murmured, lost in thought. His words felt like he had accepted the end, and I tried to stop him from talking like that. But he avoided my eyes and continued, just hang in there for another seven months. It might be even sooner. I know my body better than anyone. He smiled faintly, looking down. Hearing those words, my worst fears became real, and I couldn't stop the tears from falling. I'm sorry for making you sad. I promised when we got married that I'd never make you cry, Jack said softly. He noticed my tears, smiled sadly, and gently wiped them away. Tears welled up in his eyes too, and seeing that made me cry even more. With a trembling voice, I could only manage to say, I'll need to apologize to your parents. When I get there, I'll truly say I'm sorry for making their daughter sad. Stop it, I told him. Once he's gone, I'll be alone for the rest of my life. We used to laugh and talk about being together until the very end. But when Jack started talking like he had given up, I couldn't hide my anger. Don't talk like it's all over. Don't say such sad things. I begged. Lauren, nothing is decided yet. Medical science is advancing every day, and if we look at other hospitals, there might still be other options, I insisted. I'm going to die, Lauren. Jack said calmly. I screamed, unable to accept the truth, but he gently held my hand and spoke softly. I'll be leaving this world soon. No, I hate that idea. I replied, my heart aching. Before I go, I want to do everything I've always wanted to do. I want to spend every moment I have left with you, Jack said, smiling weakly. He started talking about his plans for the days ahead. I don't want to spend the rest of my time in the hospital. I want to go home with you. Lauren, I know you're busy with work, but could you take a few days off? I want to go on the trip we planned before. I want to make all your wishes come true, so please, Jack said, looking at me with tired eyes. Seeing him like this, I painfully realized this was not just a dream. It was real, and I had to accept it. There was no more hope. With a heavy heart, I decided to respect his wishes. I fought back my tears and told his doctor what he wanted. The doctor understood and quickly arranged for his discharge. They ran some tests to make sure it was safe, and the next day, Jack was able to leave the hospital. From that point, 
Jack spent his last days at home. Jack, I came to visit. A familiar voice called out. Hey, how are you feeling? Ready to head to the other world yet? Just kidding. It was Paul, Jack's brother. Uh, Lauren, you're here too? I thought it was just Jack, Paul said, surprised. Since we had time before dinner, I stayed in the room as long as I could to be with Jack. But suddenly, his mother, Paul, and Paul's wife, Lily, showed up to visit. It's been a while, Paul, I said, trying to stay calm. Jack's brother, Paul, is 58 and works in construction. But he skips work often and doesn't have much of a position at his age. He just drifts through life day by day. His wife, Lily, is 36 and very beautiful, but she has a stern look and speaks harshly. She has a controlling attitude that stands out, especially compared to how she acts around others. Jack's mother is 82, but looks much younger and is full of energy. However, you can see her greed on her face. She adores Paul to a strange degree and always looks down on Jack. I really can't stand Jack's family. Paul is always making rude jokes, and I'm sure Lily hates me too. From the first time we met, she treated me like an enemy and never misses a chance to make mean comments. My mother-in-law doesn't treat us like people, she constantly bothers us. To her, Jack isn't a son, he's just a source of money. The moment we meet, she starts asking for financial help. Paul has a big family, doesn't he? You two don't have kids, and you both work, so you must have some extra money. Could you help out a little? These requests for money have become normal. Paul's family, including his mother, is a family of ten. After his first wife left, he got remarried while already having four kids. He and Lily now have two more kids together, making it six children total. Their finances are tight, and they're always asking us for money. What's with all the people here? I thought, isn't it cold to treat your own mother like this? Jack, take better care of her. She's been so lonely since your father passed away, Paul said. Their mother's strange behavior started after her husband died. He had been strict but sensible. When he was alive the family got along well. But after he passed, it was like she changed completely. Jack's father used to encourage her to be kind to us, but now that he's gone, she doesn't feel any need to accept me. She only talks about money whenever she's with Jack. Before, Paul had run off with another woman and was disowned by his father. But after Jack's father died, Paul came back home with his new wife, Lily, and the disownment was lifted. This town has good support for families, but raising six kids still requires a lot of money, and they're always struggling. Jack was always shocked by their unrealistic demands. This month is tough for us financially again. Can you help us out? Paul asked. What? No. Please stop. Jack is already going through so much. How can you ask for more? I shouted, upset. Please stay out of this. This is a family matter, Paul replied calmly. That's right, Lily added, smirking. Furious at their unreasonable behavior, I couldn't hold back and yelled again. But Paul just brushed it off, and next to him, Lily laughed, waving her hand as if she was shooing away a dog. Sorry, but we really can't give you any money, I said firmly. Oh, that's a problem. I thought you'd figure something out. That's why we came all this way, Paul replied with a shrug. What a useless son, my mother-in-law muttered under her breath, grumbling as if Jack had let her down once again. I was reaching my limit with how unreasonable those three were acting. So, what's the situation? How is the cancer progressing, and when will he be discharged? His mother asked, but it was clear she didn't care. Given her greedy nature, she probably had some selfish plan. The doctors say he has about seven months to live. He's being discharged tomorrow to spend his last days at home. I replied, Is that so? As soon as they heard those words, their eyes lit up. Instead of shock or sadness, their faces were full of joy, which made me sick to my stomach. Well, we'll come by with a car to pick him up when he's discharged. He can't walk home, right? Paul chimed in. There's no need for that. Jack responded calmly, but his mother and the others kept talking excitedly. I couldn't take it anymore. Their behavior was unbearable, so I forcefully kicked them out of the room. What are you doing? They yelled. Please leave. I will handle the discharge myself. 
Your help is not needed, and honestly, I never want to see any of you again. As they tried to argue, I quickly shut the door in their faces and locked it. Then, I immediately informed the hospital staff to ensure no one except me could visit Jack. I didn't want his family anywhere near him. I'm sorry, Lauren. I've caused you so much trouble, Jack said softly. Why don't you stand up to them? I asked, my frustration growing. They treat you terribly and use you. Why should people like them live without any worries while you suffer? I was angry, and though it didn't make sense, I felt like I needed to lash out at someone. I loved Jack so much, and the thought of losing him was unbearable. I didn't want to confront them and make things worse, so I'm glad you spoke up, Jack said. Then, with a serious look on his face, he added, Lauren, I have one request for you. A request? I asked, surprised. Jack looked at me with a grave expression and said, Please, this is my first and last request. I promised I would fulfill it. After that, he entrusted me with something important. It was so unexpected, but I could tell how serious he was. I took the item home with me that night. The next day, before his family could arrive, I quickly helped Jack get discharged from the hospital. We made it home, but I couldn't shake the fear that his family would show up soon. Determined to protect Jack from them, I decided to change his plan slightly. Instead of staying at our home, I asked a friend if we could live in their villa for a while. It was sad to leave our house, but as long as Jack was with me, anywhere felt like home. When I told him that, Jack smiled shyly, and I couldn't help but blush. After explaining the situation at work, I took a long leave of absence. My only wish was to be by Jack's side until the very end. With the support of friends, Jack spent his remaining days peacefully. Eight months later, he quietly passed away. At his funeral, I saw my in-laws for the first time in a while. I expected them to say something, but instead, they just looked at me and smiled in a smug way. It gave me a strange feeling like a chill running down my spine. I wondered what they were up to, but I would soon find out. After the funeral, as I was sorting through Jack's belongings at home, the doorbell rang. When I opened the door, there stood my mother-in-law and Paul, carrying several bags. We finally found you. The neighbors told us you came back, my mother-in-law said. What are those bags for? I asked as she tried to push her way inside, complaining all the while. I blocked the doorway, refusing to let them in. Paul glared at me, annoyed. Stop standing in the way. Move aside, he demanded. I won't move. What's in those bags? And did you bring your kids too? What are you thinking? I said, noticing Paul's entire family was with him. The situation was confusing, but I knew panicking would only give them the upper hand. Clearly, they had some plan and I wasn't going to let them walk all over me. I stood firm. Then, with a mocking laugh, my mother-in-law said something shocking. From today, this house is ours. You need to leave. I was stunned. My in-laws, all ten of them, had come with the bold idea of taking over our home. Their audacity left me speechless for a moment. My son's belongings naturally belong to his blood family, don't they? He left a will for us, my mother-in-law said, waving a piece of paper in my face with a grin. Hearing this, I couldn't help but burst into laughter. The ridiculousness of their actions was overwhelming. What's so funny? My reaction seemed to irritate them. Lily peeked out from behind Paul, glaring at me as I wiped tears from my eyes, still laughing at the absurdity. I faced their angry looks and dropped a shocking truth. Don't you know? This house is already mine. What? My mother-in-law gasped. What do you mean? Echoed Paul both of them looking completely confused. Their stunned faces made me laugh again, but I quickly pulled myself together and went to get some important documents from another room. I returned with even more surprising news. As you can see, I'm now the official owner of this house. Jack transferred the ownership to me while he was still alive. I explained. What are you talking about? My mother-in-law shouted, her eyes wide with disbelief. She grabbed the documents from my hand and studied them closely with Paul. It's true. The house is in her name, they murmured, shocked. The document was official, proving that the house belonged to me. Paul and Lily immediately began protesting. How could Jack not own the house anymore, they yelled. 
Staying calm, I replied, he decided to transfer the house to me before he left the hospital. He thought it would be better for the future if the house was in my name. At this point, my mother-in-law interrupted, holding up her own copy of what she claimed was Jack's will. This can't be. Look, here's a will he wrote, she said. The paper she showed was in Jack's handwriting, but it had no official seals or signatures. It wasn't a valid legal document, which they clearly didn't understand. Their lack of knowledge made me sigh in frustration. No matter how much I explained, I knew they wouldn't accept the truth. Expecting things to escalate, I asked them to wait a moment and made a call to a lawyer. I appreciate your help. I'm sorry, but Jack's family is here about a supposed will. Could you come over quickly? Thank you, I said into the phone. Paul glared at me suspiciously. Who are you calling? I didn't give him any details, but I invited them inside. I seated my mother-in-law and Paul in the living room and told the children they could play in the bedroom. Soon, the doorbell rang, and I went to greet the person I had called. I escorted him into the living room. I apologize for the delay, I said as the suited man entered the room. Paul and the others immediately looked tense, eyeing him with suspicion. This is Mr. David, the lawyer who has been helping us with Jack's matters, I explained. Upon hearing the name lawyer, my mother-in-law's face filled with shock. A lawyer, she exclaimed, realizing the situation had become more serious than she expected. I got to know David through a friend of the owner of the villa we were renting. He had already been told about the situation. Even though he was only 32 years old, which made Jack and me feel a bit uneasy at first, he was well known among his friends for being smart and especially good at handling family disputes. After meeting him in person, we trusted him completely. Jack and I had explained everything about the inheritance and the family issues to David, and we officially hired him as our lawyer. My in-laws had no idea Jack had hired a lawyer, and they looked completely shocked. Paul and the others were wide-eyed and speechless. Let me reintroduce myself. I'm David, and I'm here at Jack's request. I will be recording this conversation for legal purposes, David said. Unlike Paul, who dressed in flashy clothes, David had a simple look short black hair and plain, clean glasses. My mother-in-law seemed to forget why she had come, as she was caught off guard by David's calm presence. He greeted them politely, and they quickly accepted his business card without thinking. When they saw his card and lawyer badge, my mother-in-law straightened up, realizing he was a real lawyer. Paul and Lily also looked tense. David and I sat on the sofa across from my in-laws, ready to begin the conversation. David smoothly turned on the voice recorder, and the discussion started. May I take a look at the will you brought? David asked in a calm tone. My mother-in-law's hand trembled a little as she handed it over. She seemed nervous, probably worried that without a lawyer on her side, things might not go the way she wanted. It's hard to twist words around when dealing with an experienced lawyer, and she seemed aware of that. David read the will carefully, and after finishing, he looked at me and gave a small nod. Thank you. I'll return this to you now, he said, handing the will back to my mother-in-law with a polite smile. His calmness only seemed to make her more anxious. Was that really Jack's will? She asked, her voice filled with doubt. Yes, it does appear to be Jack's will, David confirmed. See? With this, the house is ours, she declared confidently. But David quickly set her straight. That will is an older version, though, he added, gently lowering her expectations. What do you mean? My mother-in-law exclaimed in surprise. It seems you didn't catch that, David replied calmly. Yes, the will you presented is Jack's, but it's outdated. The will that is officially valid is this more recent one. He then pulled a newer document from his bag. This will was more recent than the one my mother-in-law had, and it clearly stated, I leave all my assets to Lauren. The previous will I wrote for my mother is hereby revoked, and this document shall stand as my official will. What? Let me see that. Lily grabbed the will from David to check it herself. The new will had a more recent date, a seal, and even Jack's fingerprint, along with a note confirming that a lawyer had overseen its creation. It was obvious which will was valid. As Lily and Paul read it, their faces turned pale. My mother-in-law's lips quivered in shock. So, what does this mean for the other will? Paul asked, 
frustration building. Unfortunately, David explained, the will your mother has is now just a useless piece of paper. At that moment, Paul exploded in anger. Ignoring the lawyer's presence, he turned on his mother and yelled, you told me all the inheritance would be yours. His voice was so fierce it seemed like he might lash out physically. Lily tried to calm him down, but he was too strong, pushing her aside as he continued shouting at his mother. My mother-in-law cowered under Paul's rage, the scene turning chaotic. Watching this unfold, I spoke firmly. Please stop causing a disturbance in someone else's home. It's really troublesome. What did you say? Paul snapped back, glaring at me. If you keep this up, David will confirm everything and will consider legal action if necessary, I added calmly. Hearing David's name seemed to bring Paul back to his senses. He realized he was dealing with a lawyer, and no matter how much he resisted, it was useless. He nervously sat back down on the sofa. I turned to my mother-in-law and asked, By the way, did Jack really write this will himself? She hesitated for a moment before answering. Yes, he wrote it for me while he was in the hospital. Her voice was laced with irritation. Was Jack happy to write it? I pressed further. My mother-in-law nodded in agreement, clearly growing tired of the questioning. I caught David's eye and gave him a signal. He adjusted his glasses and nodded to me, giving the go-ahead for what I was about to reveal to my in-laws. That's an interesting story, I began, but it seems a bit off. Actually, the hospital's security cameras recorded you forcing Jack to write that will. As I spoke, I pulled out my laptop, inserted a USB drive provided by the hospital, and played the footage. Jack had confided in David that he was pressured into writing the will, so we alerted the hospital. They cooperated and gave us the security footage. I quickly opened the video on the screen. In the video, my mother-in-law could be heard saying in a threatening tone, We'll be in trouble if you die and the inheritance doesn't come through. The footage clearly showed her pressuring Jack, with Paul and Lily also involved. If you don't want anything bad to happen to your wife, just sign the will quietly, Paul was heard saying. Lily chimed in, Jack, just sign this and nothing will happen to her, so don't worry. This video was taken five days before Jack left the hospital, as they questioned him about his cancer to ensure they'd get the inheritance. No, it wasn't like that. It was just a joke that went too far, my mother-in-law stammered. I saw a drama before going to the hospital, where the villain looked so cool. I just copied it without thinking. I didn't mean it seriously, please forgive us. As the situation turned against them, they quickly made excuses. Their words only fueled my anger, and I sighed at how pathetic they looked. If you had just admitted it, things might have been different. But trying to hide it shows your real intent, I said sternly. David, can we file charges for extortion based on this? Absolutely, David replied, smiling as he picked up the voice recorder. Their statements provide enough evidence. Paul and Lily, realizing they had forgotten about the voice recorder, were shocked. That means we'll be filing for damages against all of you, including compensation for the victim, David continued. This can't be true. Wait a minute, Lauren, Lily pleaded. It was only mom who made him sign. We were just watching. We didn't force him to sign anything. Desperate to escape responsibility, Lily tried to distance herself, leading to a heated argument between her, Paul, and their mother. It was you two who offered to help get the will written, wasn't it? My mother-in-law snapped, trying to shift the blame back to them. You said you would handle it properly, mom. We were just watching, Paul snapped. You were the ones pushing Jack to write it quickly, his mother argued. That was because Jack's medical appointment was coming up. It wasn't about rushing the will. We just didn't have much time, and we thought it should be done before Lauren got here. It seemed like they were trying to speed up their plan while I wasn't around. As Lily kept talking, she didn't seem to realize the importance of what she was admitting. The argument grew so loud and intense, I almost wanted to cover my ears. Meanwhile, the children, who had been playing nearby, noticed the noise and gathered around. Among them was a child as young as two, and the worry in their eyes was clear. The kids weren't at fault, so I quickly called over my eldest nephew, a fifth grader, and guided them to another room so they wouldn't have to see the adults fighting. He didn't fully understand what was happening, but he took his younger siblings to the other room as I asked. 
Once the kids were out of sight, I calmly turned to the three adults. Isn't this shameful? What kind of parents are you? I asked. What are you talking about? Paul asked, defensive. Denying your own responsibilities and blaming each other in front of the children? Don't you think that's pathetic? You're just trying to escape responsibility. Hearing my words, Lily suddenly realized the children had been there, and her face softened with regret. I truly am sorry. I admit everything, not just the threats. Please forgive us. Paul and his mother quickly followed suit, apologizing beside Lily in a desperate attempt to earn some forgiveness. We need to take care of our kids, so please help us financially. I don't know how we'll survive if we're charged with damages. We're done for. Please overlook this. If we've sinned, we'll make up for it. They pleaded, crying and begging. But their words only made me angrier. In the end, all you care about is yourselves and money. I don't feel any real regret from you. That's not it, Paul stammered. We're just in a tight spot, and we wanted you to understand our situation. Do you realize how your excuses sound? I asked sharply. Caught by my words, Paul fell silent, and his mother and Lily looked just as guilty. Without giving them another chance to apologize further, I let the conversation end there. I spoke even more harshly to them. I have no intention of forgiving you. If you truly care about your children, you should work harder to pay off your debts. Everything that happened is because of what you did to Jack. It's all your fault. Why should I forgive you? It's unreasonable. They were left speechless, with nothing to say in their defense. If you understand, then please leave. This house means a lot to me, and I have no intention of living with you. Lauren, please forgive us. We were wrong. Please help us. They begged, but I coldly refused. If you say one more word, I'll call the police. Finally, realizing I was serious, they panicked. They quickly gathered their children and belongings and left the house. David and I watched them go without a word, and as soon as they were gone, we locked the door and sighed in relief. The matter was finally settled. Afterward, I asked David to begin the process of claiming damages. He had everything ready, and the process went smoothly. The three of them were charged $50,000 in damages for forcing Jack to sign the will. Unable to pay such a large amount, they tried to negotiate a settlement, but I didn't budge. I insisted on full payment. Because I refused to settle, their lives changed drastically. My mother-in-law had to take care of six children on her own, and Paul and Lily were forced to work hard every day. They sold their house and moved into a cramped apartment, all ten of them, while continuing to pay the damages. Their lives won't get easier anytime soon, and they'll be struggling until their youngest child becomes an adult. In the end, I successfully cut ties with them completely. After sorting through Jack's belongings, I stayed in our home, continuing my daily work. Friends from work visit me sometimes, so I don't feel lonely. Every day, I stand in front of Jack's portrait and talk to him about the events of the day. This was the last promise I made to him. Even if I fall ill and end up in the hospital, I will never stop this daily ritual. As Jack neared the end of his life, he made one final request, for me to keep talking to him every day. I love your voice and our conversations more than anything. I hope you'll keep talking to me every day so your voice can reach me, even in heaven, he had said. After he passed away, I made a solemn vow to keep that promise. Until the day I join him, I will maintain our bond by never missing a single day of talking to him. My name is Cheryl, and at the beginning of last year, I ate too much fancy food and gained 5 kilograms. Now I'm 49 years old and trying to lose weight before the holidays. My plan is to lose 5 kilograms now so that if I gain it back during the holiday season, it won't be a big deal, right? You must be kidding, there's so much delicious food from Christmas to New Year's. It's a happy problem to have. I'll probably end up buying myself Valentine's chocolates too. Oops, I'm already drooling. Looks like I'm going to gain weight again this year. Oh well. Today, I have a story from winter that I'd like to share with you. It's about something that happened when I was 28 years old. After dating for several years, my boyfriend Paul and I got engaged and I introduced him to my parents. This was the so-called marriage greeting. My parents liked Paul and everything was supposed to go smoothly. 
But then my older sister Laura, who is three years older than me, came home from work and there was an issue. She became fixated on Paul. It's strange, but when you're sisters, you can sense each other's feelings. I could tell right away that she had fallen in love with Paul the moment she saw him. I hoped it was just a fleeting crush, but when she shook his hand, she blushed and held on a little too long. Even when she talked to him, there was this dreamy look in her eyes. I didn't think it was right for her to act like that toward my fiancé, but maybe she didn't even realize she was doing it. Emotions can be hard to control, so I decided to pretend I didn't notice, hoping my sister wouldn't act on her feelings. However, after Paul left, my sister, fresh out of the bath and still wrapped in a towel, confronted me. You should call off the engagement, she said. According to her, Paul was a womanizer, and I could find someone better. She kept criticizing him, but she didn't have any real reason for saying that. Why do you think he's a player? I asked her. It's a woman's intuition, she replied. The thing is, my sister has never had a boyfriend, so how could I trust her woman's intuition when she has no experience with men? I decided I should trust Paul, whose character I've known for years. I casually brushed off my sister's advice, saying, yeah, I'll be careful, without taking it too seriously. After that, Paul started visiting our home often. He said he wanted to build a good relationship with my family, so I invited him over, feeling comfortable about it. My parents were happy, and I hoped Paul would get along well with them since he was going to be my husband. But while things should have been going smoothly, my sister had other ideas. She tried to get close to Paul in a different way. According to Paul, when I wasn't around, she would grab his arm, press her chest against him, and ask, don't you think Mary Ann is a bit immature? She even asked for his contact details and once purposely fell down in a way that exposed her underwear. Paul said it was so over the top that it was actually funny, but I would have been worried if he was the kind of man to take it seriously. My sister believed she had a chance because Paul couldn't directly reject her since she was my sister. Every time they met, she would approach him with a sweet voice, saying, hey. It started with her falling in love at first sight, but it didn't help that Paul worked for a big company, which made him even more appealing to her. She told me, he's reliable, has a face I like, and seems like the kind of man who can provide security for the future. She was completely taken by him. My parents saw all of this happening, but said nothing. In fact, it wasn't unusual for them to stay quiet when it came to my sister's actions. Honestly, she's always been the type who struggles with things. For example, if she's asked to warm up food, she might accidentally use a plastic dish that isn't heat-resistant, and it melts. She wasn't good at studying, either, or at sports. She often skipped swimming class by making excuses like hurting her foot, feeling unwell, or having skin problems. She wasn't great at schoolwork, sports, or even household chores. And, to be honest, she's not particularly good-looking, either. Still, because she's the eldest daughter, my parents always treated her differently giving her special treatment. They even quietly pushed the responsibility of supporting her onto me. I was constantly told to make sure she stood out, but without drawing attention to myself. It felt unfair to be treated so differently as siblings, but I guess my parents saw her as someone who couldn't do much on her own and felt sorry for her. On the other hand, I've always been the type to do things quickly and efficiently. Maybe the adults didn't see much value in helping someone who could handle everything themselves. So, I became good at managing my sister's needs. Sometimes, I would even pretend to be less capable in public to keep the balance. But as I grew out of my teenage years, I realized that continuing like this wasn't going to help me in the long run. I started pushing back against my parents and doing things my way. If I had kept going along with everything, I would have become someone who couldn't do anything. When I started standing up for myself, my sister didn't like it much because she was losing my support, but we never really had a bad relationship. We could still talk normally, and sometimes I even gave her advice when she had problems. Our family had its issues, like being too protective of my sister and a little bit of tension between us, but I still thought we were a pretty normal family. However, things changed when Paul didn't return my sister's feelings. She couldn't handle the fact that her younger sister was getting married before her. The night before my wedding, my sister blurted out to our parents, I can't accept that my younger sister is getting married before me. My dad tried to calm her down, saying, Don't worry, Laura. 
You'll find a good partner soon, too. I agreed with him. Yeah, Laura, it's not a big deal. But she wasn't having it. Normally, the older sister gets married first, then the younger one. It's too soon for her. The wedding is tomorrow. I reminded her. What are you talking about, mom? Don't you care about me? I'll be the poor older sister, who's left behind while her younger sister moves on, she cried. That night, I listened quietly from the hallway as my sister and our parents argued. Should my sister really get married first? If I waited for her to marry, I would end up growing much older, without any progress in my own life. What was she thinking? I hoped she would calm down after venting her frustrations. Then I heard something shocking. We won't attend the wedding tomorrow, Laura. Please be okay with that, my father said. What? Both my parents agreed not to come to my wedding just to make my sister happy. I couldn't believe it. It was like they were under some spell, doing whatever she wanted. This went way beyond simply indulging her. Even then, my sister sighed, still not fully satisfied. Fine, I'll compromise. Let her have a wedding that nobody acknowledges. It was clear she didn't want me to marry Paul, likely because she had feelings for him. It was unbelievable that my parents wouldn't attend my wedding because of my sister's jealousy. The day of my wedding came, but I barely slept the night before. Instead of excitement, I felt anxious and uncomfortable, constantly thinking about what had happened. I'll never forget the satisfied smile on my sister's face when my parents told her they wouldn't be there. At the venue, I had to explain to Paul and his parents why mine weren't coming. I apologized and said, my sister doesn't support this marriage, so my family won't be attending. I told them it was heartbreaking to say that my own parents weren't coming to my wedding. My in-laws were shocked and couldn't believe there were parents who wouldn't attend their daughter's big day. After hearing my story, they stayed silent for a while. The mood felt so heavy, but then my mother-in-law gently took my hand, and my father-in-law placed his hand on top of ours. Remember, your family is here with you. Don't let this day be a sad one. Come on, why don't you smile, my mother-in-law said warmly. Her words made me tear up. Paul, seeing me cry, softly stroked my head and said, Ashley, I'm your husband now, so please stop saying that your family isn't here. My in-laws and Paul quickly tried to cheer me up, jokingly telling me not to cry because my makeup would smudge. Then, my mother-in-law looked at me with kindness and said, Ashley, I know things are hard with your family back home, but this is the start of a new life. Let's build your own family together. Even though I felt abandoned, her words and her strong embrace gave me comfort. Paul and my father-in-law joined in with hugs, and I told myself that everything would be okay. Like my mother-in-law said, this was a new beginning. I promised myself that I would build my own happy family, and on that day, I officially married Paul. Eighteen years have passed since that day. In that time, Paul and I had a daughter and three sons. Our daughter is capable and looks after her three mischievous brothers, who sometimes turn the house upside down. I surprise even myself with how often I end up shouting, Stop it now. Paul's career has been going well, we bought a house, and we've been living a stable life. But then, something unexpected happened. My father, mother, and sister showed up at our house. After the wedding, I had kept my distance from them and hadn't given them our new address. Yet somehow they found us and came unannounced. When they appeared, instead of a warm, long time no see, the first words out of my mouth were, What do you want? I need a favor from you, my sister said. My parents added, It's something only you can do for us, looking at me with serious expressions. I had no idea what they could possibly want after 18 years of silence. Half curious and half afraid, I wondered what was going on. I stayed quiet as my mom spoke up. We want you to give Paul to your sister. What? Both Paul and I were stunned by her words. Wait a minute, what do you mean I need to give Paul away? I asked sharply. My parents both looked away, guilty, while my sister stood there, smug and proud. She's still single and she's turning 45 this year. That's a problem, my father said. His words made no sense to me, and Paul looked just as confused. Actually, my father continued, the company she worked for recently went out of business, and she's unemployed now. It's tough. We're worried about her future, being single and without a job. We hope you understand. Since your sisters, 
You should feel the same way. In my mind, I thought, no, I definitely don't think so, but I stayed silent, waiting to see what they would say next. I was getting frustrated with how slowly my father was speaking, but I held back from saying anything, eager to hear his point. She's always liked Paul, and she's still alone because of it. You've had your time with him. Could you let her have him for the rest of her life? What? Paul and I were speechless. My parents kept pleading, please, while my sister stood there confidently, certain she would get what she wanted. Given how my parents always catered to her, it made sense that she believed this, but the request was outrageous. As I put my head in my hands, Paul pulled me aside and whispered, this could actually be a chance. A chance? What do you mean? I asked. Well, remember that joke you made when you were drunk? It's like it's coming true, he said with a small grin. Then should we go with it? I asked. We stood up and turned back to face my sister and parents. Do you really love Paul that much? I asked. My sister was caught off guard. She blinked in surprise and repeated, Yes, yes. I've loved him all this time. Wow, that's some serious love, I said. You've been in love with him for 18 years, even though he's married to me? Yes, she said. It's been so painful watching you and Paul together. It should have been me. Paul and I could barely hold back our laughter at her serious tone. I took a deep breath and said, All right, I give up. If you love him that much, I'll step aside. My parents were shocked. My mom quickly asked, Really? Don't you love Paul too? No, actually, I said, looking at Paul. To be honest, I've always liked Laura. Paul played along, turning to my sister and saying, Yeah, I've always liked her too. My sister's face lit up with joy. Really? She asked, her face flushed with excitement. I knew it. You never resisted when I hugged you, and your eyes always looked so loving, my sister said, excitedly. I've been waiting for this moment, and finally, it's here. I had to hold back my laughter, and I could see Paul pretending to cry, though his shoulders were shaking from trying not to laugh. We just needed to keep this up a little longer. We'll always be together from now on, Paul, my sister suddenly said, acting as if they had been a couple all along. She was so casual about it, like she'd been living in this fantasy for the last 18 years. Laura, I'm happy, Paul replied with a smile. Please be my support from now on. Yes, absolutely, she said, clearly thrilled. So, I'm going to quit my job, Paul announced, grinning. My sister's smile faded in an instant, and her face turned to shock. Really? Yeah, I want to be with you all the time, Laura. So I'm quitting my job to always stay by your side. What? She stammered, clearly not expecting this. I won't even go outside anymore. Paul continued cheerfully. I'll follow you everywhere. I'll even watch you do housework from behind. My sister froze for a moment, her panic setting in, while our parents looked visibly disturbed. But I'm not working either. This is a problem, she muttered. What's the problem? If we're together, we have nothing to fear. We don't need money to be happy, Paul replied. But nowadays, we need to pay for things like insurance. It's not like the old days. We can't just live on love alone, she argued, her eyes starting to lose focus. Sensing the moment was right, I jumped in. Paul, if we end up divorcing, I'll be taking a large share of the assets, so you better pay up. Don't worry, Paul said with a laugh. Your sister and parents will take care of everything. Hearing this, my parents turned pale and exchanged worried glances. Laura, my father said, this is hard to admit, but this isn't right. Stealing your sister's husband, it's wrong. Exactly, Laura, my mom added, suddenly backing away from the plan. It was as if all the passion and support for my sister vanished in an instant. What are you talking about? You promised Paul to me. Laura yelled, her frustration growing. That was before my father began, but she cut him off. I don't want to hear it. Doesn't anyone support me? Laura screamed, and in her frenzy, she grabbed my mom's hair. My father tried to calm her down, but it was chaos. In the middle of all this, Paul calmly spoke up. Laura, to be honest, you're not my type. I respect you as Ashley's sister, but that's it. Everyone fell silent, their attention now on him. 
I don't really want to interact much with you, especially when you look at me like that, Paul said. That gaze actually turns me off. Knowing that someone has unreturned feelings for me is really uncomfortable. His honest words left my sister and parents speechless. But Paul, what was all that earlier? My sister asked, clearly confused. Stop acting so casually with someone else's husband, I said firmly. There's no way he could fall for you. We have a family, and we're happy. As I said this, I stopped my sister, who was walking toward Paul with a pale face. You tricked me, she shouted. How could you think that someone who hasn't contacted you in 18 years still loves you? Isn't that a bit unrealistic? I asked. My sister's face turned red, and she started to tear up, clearly out of frustration. If you were really attractive, maybe it would be different. But no one finds charm in someone who is unemployed, dependent on their parents, and can't do basic things because their mom has always done them. At your age, a marriage wouldn't last long with those traits, I said plainly. Paul quietly chuckled behind me. My sister, hit by the truth of my words, began to cry loudly, unable to stop. Our parents tried to come for her, but they looked confused, as if they were realizing that what I said was true. I'm not giving Paul to you. I continued. So please give up, Laura. At that, she cried even harder, like a child throwing a tantrum. It was a sad sight for an adult, and it was clear she hadn't matured. Take this as a lesson, and please don't involve yourself in our lives again, I said. No matter what trouble you face in the future, don't expect any help from us. With that, I slowly closed the front door. When my children asked what happened, I simply said, it's Halloween season, and it seems a ghost came early. My eldest suggested we exorcise the spirit, but I stopped the idea, though it did feel like there was a ghost wailing outside as my sister continued to cry. Six years passed, and she's still single. She found a job but got fired for inappropriate behavior, and she caused trouble by rushing into a marriage that didn't work out. Now, she's banned from matchmaking events and seems likely to stay single for life. My parents, despite being tired, are still working part-time jobs to save money for her. They've probably realized they can't rely on her to take care of them in the future. Hopefully, they now understand the consequences of spoiling her all these years. I spend my days as a homemaker, without having to worry about school fees for my kids, thanks to my smart children and my husband, who has a stable job. Sometimes, I wonder if working outside the home would help me burn off the extra calories I gained during the holiday season from eating too much. My daughter, who is already slim, is entering her growth phase and has been talking about wanting to go on a diet. I'm trying to convince her not to. You can think about dieting when you're older, like me, I tell her. My three sons love dancing and recently showed off their skills at a local event, where they won several awards. They proudly say, we're going to be in Pearl Jam one day. So, I really hope Pearl Jam stays together until they grow up. We regularly get visits from my in-laws, who are as dear to me as my own parents. We always enjoy delicious meals together. When the kids have their spring break, we plan to take a trip to a spa, and I'm excited about spending some quality time together. Although there were many challenges before marriage, my life since then has been filled with happiness. The bonds within our family have grown stronger, and I'm grateful for the love we share. I hope everyone stays healthy and lives long so we can continue to make precious memories together as a family. When I was just six years old, my life took a rough turn. My parents, who never seemed to say a kind word to me, yelled at me one day and told me to leave the house. They always seemed to favor my younger brother, Adam, which made me feel like I didn't belong. I remember walking down the dark streets, scared and alone, until a kind woman came up to me and took me in. Fast forward 16 years, and I had become a successful woman. When my parents came back into my life, I was ready to face them differently, determined to change everything. I grew up in a wealthy family in Chicago. Despite all the money, I often felt invisible in my own home. My parents, Mr. and Mrs. Peter, were powerful lawyers who cared a lot about their status and success. They adored Adam, who did well in school and easily got their praise. In contrast, I struggled to meet their high standards, always feeling ignored and mistreated. No matter what I did, it was never enough to earn their approval. But little did I know, 
my life would change greatly thanks to my Aunt Lauren. My name is Anna, and at seven, things reached a breaking point. I had just come home from school, nervous about my test results. I had studied hard, but still didn't get the grade my parents wanted. That evening, I heard their raised voices in the living room. She's a disappointment, my mom shouted. We've given her every chance, and what do we get in returns? I stood frozen outside my bedroom door, tears running down my cheeks. I wanted to scream, why can't you see I'm trying, but the words wouldn't come out. Later that night, after dinner, they confronted me. Anna, we can't keep doing this, my dad said coldly. You need to shape up, or you'll have to find somewhere else to live. At first, I thought it was a joke, but when I saw his serious face, my heart sank. Where will I go? I whispered, scared. Figure it out, he replied harshly. That was the final straw. My heart pounded as I packed a small bag, knowing my life was about to change forever. I had nowhere to go. I left the house and wandered the streets of Jacksonville, feeling lost and scared. The city lights were so bright, and the sounds of people laughing and talking around me made me feel even more alone. I felt like I didn't belong in a place that should have felt like home. As the hours passed, I started to lose hope. Just when I thought things couldn't get worse, I saw a familiar face. It was my Aunt Lauren looking worried. Anna, what are you doing here? She asked. I, I didn't know where else to go, I said, my voice shaking. Without a second thought, she hugged me. Come with me, she said softly. You're safe now. Lauren was 42 and managed a restaurant. She had always been there for me, the only one who truly believed in me. I followed her to her small apartment, feeling a tiny bit of hope return. As we settled in, she made me a warm bowl of soup. I was so worried about you, she said gently. You can stay here as long as you need. Living with Lauren changed my life. She filled the emptiness my parents left behind. You're smart, Anna. You can do anything you set your mind to, she'd say. With her support, I started doing better in school, working harder than ever to show I could succeed. Meanwhile, Adam was struggling with our parents' high expectations. I could see the stress was wearing him down. One evening, I found him sitting in our old neighborhood, playing his guitar. Hey, are you okay? I asked, sitting beside him. Just thinking, he said, his face serious. Mom and Dad want me to follow their path, but I want to do music. It's like they don't care about what I want. I understand, I said, feeling our shared pain. You have to follow your passion. They'll be so mad, he sighed, looking at his guitar. Maybe it's time to stand up for yourself, I suggested, hoping to give him a little courage. You deserve to be happy. As the weeks went by, I thrived under Lauren's care, but the gap between Adam and our parents grew wider. When they found out he had enrolled in a performing arts school, the argument that followed was unforgettable. One evening, the tension finally reached a breaking point. I came home from school to find our parents arguing with Adam. You're throwing your life away. Dad yelled, his face red with anger. No, Dad. I'm doing what I love, Adam said, his voice rising. This isn't how we raised you. You're wasting your potential, Mom added, her tone sharp and cold. My heart pounded as I stepped into the living room. This isn't fair. Adam has the right to choose his own path, I shouted, feeling adrenaline rush through me. Stay out of this, Anna, my dad snapped. You've already done enough damage. In that moment, I realized how deep the divide between us had grown. I watched Adam stand his ground, but it was clear our parents' control was crushing him. This fight wasn't just a turning point for Adam. It changed something in me, too. As I settled into life with Lauren, I felt hope again. She was my rock, always cheering me on and reminding me of my worth. Her small apartment was warm and full of laughter, with the comforting smell of home-cooked meals. It was so different from the cold, demanding home I had left behind. Anna, you're going to be a doctor one day. I just know it, Lauren would say while helping me with my homework. You have the heart for it. Her belief in me lit a fire. I threw myself into my studies, determined to succeed. School became my safe place, where I could escape the painful memories of my childhood. I worked hard for high grades, wanting to prove my worth, 
not just to myself, but to my parents too. As I thrived in school, I often thought about Adam. He was still living with our parents, and I worried about him. One day, I called him. Hey, how's everything? I asked, trying to sound cheerful. It's the same. Mom and Dad just don't understand, he replied, his voice full of frustration. They think I'll change my mind and go to law school like them. You won't, though, I said firmly. You're too talented for that. You need to follow your passion. I know, but it's hard with them always pushing me, Adam admitted. I wish I could just get away like you did. Maybe you can, I suggested, feeling a burst of hope. You could come stay with me and Lauren for a while. It might help you figure things out. Yeah, maybe, he said, though I could hear the doubt in his voice. As the months went by, my hard work toward becoming a doctor started to pay off. I graduated high school with honors and got a scholarship to a top university. When I opened my acceptance letter, I couldn't hold back my excitement. I jumped up and down, clutching the letter tightly. I did it, Lauren. I'm going to be a doctor. I shouted. Lauren hugged me, her eyes filling with happy tears. I always knew you could do it, Anna. You deserve this. But even with my happiness, I felt a bit of fear. I knew the path ahead would be hard, and I worried about what would come next for both me and Adam. I also knew my parents would probably react the same way they always did, without much pride or warmth. When I called them to share the news about my scholarship, their response was cold. That's great, Anna, my dad said, sounding flat. But remember, medical school is tough. You'll have to be perfect. Why can't you just be proud of ours? Lauren said, frustrated. She's worked so hard for this. There was silence from my parents. They were still the same, only seeing my achievements as things I had to do, not as things to celebrate. It hurt, but I refused to let their disappointment ruin my happiness. Once I started university, I threw myself into my studies. Medical school is tough, but I loved every bit of it. Learning new things fueled my passion, and I enjoyed the challenges. Late nights studying were often brightened by texts from Adam, who was finding his own path. Just finished another song, he texted one night. It's about breaking free from expectations. I can't wait to hear it. I replied, feeling proud of him and hoping he'd find the courage to follow his dreams. As I moved forward in my studies, my parents tried reaching out again, but it felt empty. They sent me an email, suggesting I should think about law school instead, even offering to help pay. Anna, think about what a law degree could mean for your future, they wrote. Anger rose up in me, and I slammed my fist on the desk, shouting at the computer screen, I don't want to be a lawyer. I'm going to be a doctor. One afternoon, Lauren found me in this state. What's wrong? She asked, concerned. They think I should drop everything and follow their path, I said, frustration spilling over. It's like they can't accept who I am. Anna, you are strong. Lauren said softly. You've come so far. Don't let their expectations pull you down. Her words reminded me of my purpose. I was determined to break free from my past and follow my dream of helping children. I threw myself deeper into my studies, finding a sense of belonging and purpose I had never felt before. But even as I moved forward, the shadows of my past stayed with me. I had left my childhood home, but the scars from my parents' rejection still hurt. I couldn't shake the feeling that they would never truly accept me. Despite this, I kept going, driven by Lauren's love and my own dream of a better future. Little did I know the hardest test was still ahead and my need for acceptance would only get more challenging. As I went through medical school, I felt like I was finally becoming the person I was meant to be. I had a purpose, and my passion for helping children pushed me forward. I had friends who shared my dreams, and for the first time, I felt like I belonged. But even as I thrived in this new world, my parents' presence still hung over me like a dark cloud. I would get emails from them now and then, reminders of what they wanted for me and suggestions that I consider law instead of medicine. Each time I read those emails, old anger would bubble up, but I had learned to push those feelings aside. One evening, while I was studying for an exam, my phone buzzed. It was a message from Adam. Can we talk? I need to figure things out. I felt a wave of concern. Of course, come over, I replied, eager to help him. When Adam arrived, 
He looked more stressed than ever. I can't take it anymore, Anna. Mom and Dad won't let up, he said, running his hand through his hair. They think I'm just wasting my life on music. You know that's not true, I said, trying to reassure him. You have real talent, and you deserve to follow your passion. I know, but every time I try to talk to them, it's like talking to a wall, he said, frustration clear in his voice. They just don't understand. As we talked, I could see how hard this was for him. I knew exactly how suffocating it felt to be constantly pushed in a direction you didn't want to go. Maybe it's time to stand up to them, I suggested. You deserve to be happy. Adam nodded slowly, but I could see he was still unsure. I don't want to lose them completely. Sometimes, you have to take a stand for yourself, I said softly. I answered. I had to do the same thing. It's hard, but you'll be better for it. Days turned into weeks, and as I focused on my studies, the thought of facing my parents was always in the back of my mind. I knew that one day, I'd have to confront them. Then, one evening, I got a call from my mom. We'd like to have a family dinner, she said. It's important. A knot formed in my stomach. Sure, I replied cautiously, unsure of what they wanted. The dinner was set for a few days later. As it got closer, I felt a mix of nervousness and hope. I wanted to believe they might be ready to understand me, but part of me was preparing for more disappointment. When the day came, I arrived at the restaurant early, my heart racing as I waited. When my parents, Mr. and Mrs. Peter, walked in, they looked as serious as ever. They sat down, and I could feel the tension. Thank you for coming, my mom began, her voice calm but cold. We wanted to talk about our family and our future. Okay, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I've been thinking, my dad said, leaning forward, about your education and future. We believe it's time for you to consider law school. My heart sank. I've told you before, dad. I want to be a doctor. That's what I love, I replied firmly. Passion doesn't pay the bills. He shot back, frustration clear in his tone. You need to think practically. Practicality isn't everything, I replied, feeling anger rise inside me. I've worked hard to get where I am, and I won't let you push me into something I don't want. The tension grew, and other people in the restaurant were beginning to notice our argument. Anna, we just want what's best for you, my mom said, her voice shaking a little. But you're not making smart choices? No, you're not listening. You've never listened, I said, unable to hold back anymore. You've spent my whole life judging me by grades and achievements. I'm done with that. At that moment, Adam walked into the restaurant, noticing the tension. He came over, his eyes full of concern. What's going on, he asked. Just a family discussion, my dad said dismissively, but it was clear things had gotten heated. This doesn't look like family, Adam replied, giving our parents a hard look. You can't keep doing this to her or to us. What do you know about families? My mom shot back harshly. More than you think, Adam said, stepping closer to me. Anna deserves support, not judgment. We both do. In that moment, all the emotions that had been bottled up for years finally spilled over. All the feelings I had kept bottled up for years came rushing out. I realized I had spent too long trying to earn their love and approval, only to find that nothing would ever be enough. I'm done trying to live up to your standards. I shouted, my voice shaking. I'm finally happy, and I won't let you take that away from me. The restaurant fell silent, and I felt everyone's eyes on us. It was a moment of complete honesty, with all the pain, rejection, and struggle of my childhood laid bare. As I looked around, I knew I was ready to leave the past behind and reclaim my life. But I also knew that this was just the beginning of a bigger battle. The silence was thick. My heart raced as I stood there, facing my parents with my true feelings out in the open. Adam stood beside me, his presence comforting. I saw the shock on my parents' faces, but I wasn't going to back down. Anna, this isn't how you should talk to us, my dad finally said, his voice a bit shaky. Why not? I shot back, still angry. I've spent my whole life trying to please you, and it's only made me feel worse. I'm not a disappointment. I'm doing what I love. Adam turned to them, his gaze strong. You need to understand that forcing us into careers we don't want isn't love. It's control. 
My mom looked stunned, her usual authority fading. We thought we were doing what was best for you, she said softly, a hint of hurt in her voice. Best for us or best for you? I replied, feeling the weight of my words. You've never seen us for who we really are, just your expectations. In that moment, I felt a change in myself. I was no longer the scared little girl trying to earn their approval. I was an adult, a future doctor with dreams of helping others, and I was finally ready to stand up for myself and for Adam. Enough of this, I said firmly. I won't let you control my future anymore. I'm going to be a pediatrician, and nothing you say will change that. Tears welled up in my mom's eyes as she seemed to realize the impact of her actions. I just wanted you both to have secure futures, she whispered. I thought that would make you happy. Mom, happiness isn't just about a job or title, Adam said gently. It's about being true to ourselves. I want to make music, and Anna wants to help children. That's what will make us happy. The restaurant stayed quiet, but I felt a huge weight lift off my shoulders. For the first time, I could breathe freely. I had finally spoken my truth, and it felt freeing. Maybe we've been too focused on our own ideas of success, my dad admitted, sounding regretful. We didn't mean to push you away. I could see they were sincere, but I also knew words alone wouldn't fix everything. It's going to take time, I said calmly. Time for me to trust you again. But I'm willing to try if you are. With a deep sigh, my mom nodded. We want to support you, Anna. Really, we do. Can we start fresh? Adam and I exchanged a glance. Let's take it one step at a time, I replied carefully. There's a lot to work through. As we left the restaurant, I felt lighter. That talk had opened a door, not just for healing, but also for understanding. My parents were finally starting to see the importance of unconditional love. In the weeks that followed, we began rebuilding our relationship. It wasn't easy. Old habits are hard to break, but my parents made an effort to show their support. They came to my medical school events, and for the first time, I felt they were truly trying to understand my passion. Meanwhile, Adam kept following his dream in music. He played at local gigs, slowly building his own path. I admired his courage and felt proud of him for standing up for what he believed in. Eventually, Lauren, Adam, and I decided to open a community center for kids. We wanted to create a safe place where children could explore their passions, just like we had fought for ours. At the center's opening, surrounded by happy faces, I felt a deep sense of fulfillment. I had come so far, from a scared girl looking for approval to a woman who embraced her dreams and fought for her family. My journey taught me that love isn't about meeting expectations. It's about supporting each other as we truly are. And that was a lesson worth sharing. I was lying in bed, feeling weak and sick, when my husband, Paul, smiled and said, I only married you because you're the boss's daughter. I looked over at the scarves and gloves I had lovingly knitted for him, now tossed aside like they didn't matter. His words stung. He seemed so disappointed in me, and I knew I had to wake him up to reality. I chuckled at the thought of him realizing how wrong he was, thinking everything was going his way. My name is Kelly Riley. I've been married to Paul for six years now. We don't have any children, but we've been living happily together. Paul works a lot and is often away from home. Sometimes I feel lonely, but he always makes an effort to spend time with me on his days off, which helps me manage the loneliness. I met Paul through my father, who was his boss at the time. After we got married, Paul suggested that I become a stay-at-home wife. It seemed like a good idea to me, and I had plenty of time for myself. While supporting Paul, I started making friends with the neighbors, doing some exercise, and taking up sewing. I tried different things to fill my time, but sewing and knitting became my favorite hobbies. Every winter, I would knit scarves and gloves for Paul. My first few attempts weren't great, but I got better with time. Eventually, Paul even told me they were as good as the ones you could buy from a store. Hearing his kind words made me love sewing even more. I dreamed of one day sewing with our future child. I mentioned it to Paul, and he smiled, saying, Maybe I'll join in and learn when the time comes. It was moments like these that made me feel happy in my life. I also made sure to take good care of the house and always spent quality time with Paul when he had days off. Thanks to his good salary, 
We had a comfortable life, and from the outside, I probably seemed very lucky. I had no complaints and thought we would continue living quietly like this, just the two of us, with hopes for a child in the future. But about three years ago, things started to change. One evening, I was waiting for Paul to come home, as I always did. Suddenly, I felt dizzy and collapsed. Paul had just returned from work and rushed me to the hospital. When I woke up, I found myself lying in a hospital bed. From the conversation between Paul and the doctor, I learned that my condition wasn't minor and would be something I'd have to deal with for the rest of my life. Thankfully, it wasn't life-threatening, but the doctor warned that it could happen again. They recommended I stay in the hospital until I was a bit stronger. Seeing that I was worried, Paul reassured me, it looks like you'll be in the hospital for a while, but it's okay. I'll come visit whenever I have time off from work. We'll get through this together. He held my hand as he spoke, and his words eased my fear. With my supportive husband by my side, I believed that everything would be fine, even though there wasn't any real reason to think that. True to his word, Paul visited me almost every day after that. He held my hand, asked me how I was feeling, and tried to keep my spirits up. When I told him the hospital days felt long and boring, he brought me my favorite sewing tools. We would sit together, sewing and chatting about little things that happened during the day. Teaching my clumsy husband how to sew was especially fun, and it made me forget the boredom for a while. These happy moments in the hospital went on for about a year. Last winter, I made him another scarf as part of our yearly tradition. But after that, I noticed Paul started visiting less and less. Now, if he showed up once every few weeks, I considered myself lucky. At first, I thought he was just swamped with work, so I kept myself busy with sewing. I even started making a pair of gloves to surprise him the next time he came. The doctor told me I might be able to go home by the end of the year, so I planned to give Paul the gloves as a gift when I was discharged. I put all my love and effort into making those gloves, hoping they would help bridge the time we had been apart. But when Paul finally came to visit after a long absence, his reaction crushed me. I handed him the gloves, and instead of being happy, he looked at them with cold eyes and said, Are you still making these? They're just becoming a nuisance now. Then, without a second thought, he handed me the scarf I had knitted for him last year, along with divorce papers. The scarf looked untouched, like he had never even worn it. Has it been three years since you've been in the hospital? I heard you'll be discharged soon, but I can't keep taking care of you, he said. We should get a divorce. I looked down at the divorce papers when I heard Paul's words. He had already signed them. I thought to myself, so, this is where we've ended up. To be honest, ever since he stopped visiting me regularly, I had considered the possibility of divorce more than once. I tried to push those thoughts away, convincing myself that he was just busy with work. But deep down, I knew better. The Paul the first knew would never ignore me, no matter how much work he had. If his job had really gotten busier, he would have told me. When he started disappearing without any explanation, I had a feeling this was coming. That's why, when I asked him why he wanted a divorce, I wasn't as upset as I thought I'd be. I wasn't trying to hold on to him. I knew I had probably become a burden to him. If the kind Paul the first used to know was now asking for a divorce, I figured I didn't really have a choice. But I was still curious. He had once promised we'd get through this together, so I wanted to know why he had changed his mind. When I asked, Paul responded, Isn't it obvious? Ever since I married you, all I've had are problems. I'm sick of the scarves and gloves you give me every year. I only married you because you're the boss's daughter. How can I be expected to deal with you being sick on top of everything else? He laughed in a way that felt like he was mocking me. It was as if all the joy I had found in our life together, all the talks we had about love, happiness, and loneliness, meant nothing to him. He made it clear that he thought I was a fool for believing in those things. He continued, who even wears a handmade scarf anymore without feeling embarrassed? Getting gifts like that is just annoying. As I listened to him, I glanced at his neck and noticed a high-end scarf I didn't remember giving him. Compared to the scarves I made for him, this one was obviously of much better quality. There was no point in comparing mine to that one. It made me wonder if he had ever actually worn any of the things I made for him. He must have hated them all along and I just never realized it. 
After I was hospitalized, my father retired from the company shortly after. That meant Paul no longer had to pretend to care about me to stay in my father's good graces. Plus, having a sick wife might have been a convenient excuse for him at work. In the first year of my illness, he made a big show of visiting me whenever he could, balancing work and showing concern for me. I could easily imagine my father, before he retired, praising Paul at work, saying how hardworking he was while also taking care of his sick wife. Paul had built this image of being a caring husband, and his co-workers respected him for it. But now, it seemed that once my father retired, Paul didn't see any value in me anymore. The part of me that had once been useful to him had been realized, and now he no longer needed me. When I shared my thoughts, feeling sick inside, my husband looked surprised. Then he casually admitted, well, it did make work easier. When I mentioned you, everyone felt sorry for me and treated me well. If I worked a bit of overtime, they praised me for being responsible. And if I wanted time off, all I had to say was, my wife is sick, and that was it. He said all of this without a hint of regret. He had used my illness to his advantage in ways I had never noticed. As for the promotion I'm up for, he continued, I mean, the others are idiots, but I do have to thank your illness for that. I listened quietly with my head down. When I finally looked up, I saw a smug grin on his face. The man I once loved was gone, replaced by someone I didn't recognize. This was his true self. Well, if I was able to help you, I guess that's good, I said. We probably won't see each other again, so take care. I handed him the divorce papers. He had no more use for me after that and quickly turned to leave. And just like that, our divorce was final. After he left, I cried softly to myself. After some time, I was discharged from the hospital and went back to my parent house. When my father heard what had happened, he was furious. I never thought he could be that kind of person, he said, his voice raised. But for me, it didn't matter anymore. I calmed my father down and told him that once I cleaned up the house, I wanted to move back in with my parents. They understood and told me to do whatever made me happy. For now, I decided to live with them. Before moving back in with my parents, I wanted to visit the house where I had lived with my husband. But when we got there, I found that the front door lock wasn't working. My parents and I exchanged confused looks and decided to ring the doorbell. A stranger answered the door. Feeling puzzled, I asked him about the situation. He told me that he had bought the house a while ago and had been living there for a few months with his wife and child. They seemed happy. My parents were even angrier after hearing this, but I didn't want to cause any trouble for the new family. I bowed my head and quietly left. However, I couldn't just leave it like that, so I called my ex-husband right away. On the phone, he answered casually, Oh yeah, I sold the house while you were in the hospital. Keeping the money from the sale is like compensation for me. It was my house to begin with, so you don't really have any complaints, right? I couldn't help but sigh at how indifferent he was. I wish he had told me sooner. From what the new owner said, the house had been sold quite a while ago. My husband probably put it up for sale about a year ago, around the time he stopped visiting me. Even if he had planned to divorce me, selling the house without discussing it with me was just outrageous. Our divorce had already been finalized when we signed the papers, but since I was still in the hospital, we had agreed to talk about compensation and dividing assets after my discharge. We had a meeting planned for next week, but he decided to act on his own. It was unbelievable. What made it worse was that he didn't even think he had done anything wrong. So I calmly told him over the phone, you really don't understand anything, do you? Huh? What do you mean? He asked sounding confused. I'll explain everything in detail next week. I replied and hung up the phone. I smiled at my worried parents and then turned to my father. I need a favor, I said, sharing my plan with him and asking him to help me get ready for what was coming. I understand, my father said, his face serious but supportive. I've already prepared the necessary documents. There's not much time before the meeting next week, but we'll manage. I could see a hint of regret in his eyes, probably because he had once recommended my husband to me. But his anger at what my husband had done seemed to drive him to help me as much as he could. I thanked my father and waited for the day of the meeting. 
The thought of seeing my husband's reaction made me smile for the first time in a while. With my father's help, we got everything ready for the meeting. We decided to hold the discussion at my parents' home. My parents and I sat together on one side, and my husband sat alone across from us. I'm sure he knew my parents were hurt by the divorce, but it didn't seem to bother him anymore. He didn't show any sign of respect towards them, and his face even held a hint of a smile. His attitude was arrogant, as if he didn't have anything to worry about. I'm the victim here, he began, but I'm not going to ask for too much. The money from the sale of the house will be enough. He spoke as if he was being generous, like he was doing us a favor by not asking for more. Seeing his smug attitude, my father's face turned red with anger. I gently placed my hand on his to calm him down. There was no need for us to get upset. We knew that in this discussion, my husband was the one who would be at a disadvantage, not us. There's something important we need to talk about first, I said, keeping my voice calm. I spoke up and my father handed over a document. It was proof that the land where the house stood was owned by him. Yes, the house was in your name. There's no question about that, I said. But the land the house was built on belongs to my father, and he still holds the title to it. That's clear from this document, right? My husband's expression changed slightly, his brow furrowing. So what? He replied. The house was mine. No one has the right to complain. Do you think you can get back at me with that? He chuckled, as if he found the whole situation ridiculous. I continued calmly. It's true that the house was in your name, and legally, you could sell it. I'm sure you checked all of this before you sold the house, and there's no legal issue with your actions. My husband seemed confident, knowing there was no problem from a legal standpoint. However, I said, for the family who bought the house, this is a big issue. You sold the house, but since we still own the land, my father can charge them rent. That would definitely cause them trouble, don't you think? The situation isn't what they were led to believe. I paused before continuing. Now, neither my father nor I intend to charge them rent or make them leave. But we also don't plan on just giving away the rights to our land for nothing. In that case, we would sell the land to the family. We wouldn't demand monthly rent, but it would be a problem for us if they didn't buy the land. My father gifted that land to us to live on, not for it to be handed over to strangers. I added, and if they don't buy it, the family could sue you. As I said, the deal wasn't what they expected. Can you imagine their frustration? They thought they were buying their dream home, only to find out the land isn't theirs and they now have more expenses. After we obtained proof of my father's ownership of the land, we went straight to the new family and explained the situation. Thankfully, they understood and agreed that if there was any trouble, it was the seller's responsibility. If things didn't go well with the negotiations, they made it clear they would sue my husband. When I saw my husband's face turn pale, I knew he finally understood the gravity of the situation. He realized that no matter what, this was going to cost him a lot of money because of his mistake. In a trembling voice, he asked, what should I do then? I smiled and calmly responded, the family can buy the land from us, making them the full owners of both the house and the land. Then you would have to cover the cost of the land. This way, everything can be settled smoothly and there would be no need for the family to sue you. Once they own both the house and the land, all the issues will be resolved. However, since they weren't informed about the land price when they bought the house, they will likely make you pay for it. That's not their problem to deal with, it's yours. The real issue is that the land is in a prime location and its value could be higher than what you sold the house for. Even if you give up all your assets, it might not be enough. In the end, you could be left with nothing. I paused for a moment and continued. Another option is for you to buy the house back and then pay for the land. Of course, you have to cover the relocation fee for the family living there. This would give you back both the house and the land, and you could try selling them again, maybe making some money. But after paying for everything, you probably won't end up with much, if anything at all. Whichever option you choose, you'll be at a loss, I added. And let's not forget about alimony. Your actions have caused me a lot of mental distress, and I plan to ask for compensation for that. Keep that in mind. All this time, Paul had used me as a tool to help his career. Now that I understood this, I felt disgusted by everything he had done.
I also plan to file for damages for the emotional harm he caused me. Even though it might be hard to prove and I might not win, bringing up these issues was important, especially considering the situation he's in now. Paul, now cornered, didn't seem to have the ability to fully process what was happening. It looked like all these things could become his reality soon. My father, seeing the opportunity, added, even though I'm retired, I still have many connections at the company. I've been talking to some of my old colleagues, and they've told me what you've been saying about my daughter and how you've treated her. People at work have lost all respect for you, Paul. With a cheerful smile, my father delivered this news, and I could see Paul finally grasping the seriousness of the situation. The status he had built by using me and the money he had gained from selling the house without my consent, none of that mattered anymore. Now, I said, clasping my hands together with a smile, let's discuss what comes next. We need to settle the division of assets, compensation, and the house. The smile I gave him now was different from any smile I had shown him before. This time, I was smiling more brightly than I had in a long time, feeling a sense of relief and power since our separation. I hope you understand that your assets will be decided in this meeting, I continued. Paul could only force a laugh, but tears filled his eyes. The negotiations that followed were in my favor. Paul agreed to pay me alimony, and we also settled that he would pay for the land where the house stood. We later explained everything to the family who had bought the house, and in the end, everyone benefited from the agreement, except Paul. He lost everything. The rumors my father had started spread throughout the company, causing Paul to lose his reputation. His expected promotion was delayed as upper management raised concerns. The rumors continued, and soon Paul had no place in the company. My father later informed me that Paul had resigned. I guess you could call it karma. Things gained through using others can disappear just as easily when someone decides to take action. As for me, I'm now living with my parents and running a sewing class. While my classes aren't packed, I've managed to earn a decent income thanks to the support of neighborhood women and children who attend. Even though I never had the chance to sew with my own children like I once dreamed of, I've realized that sharing what I love with others brings me real happiness.